12 point. So let's go. All right, welcome everybody. Happy New Year. Hello to Lancaster and San Diego. I'm so excited to be here on this side this time. Uh, my name is Daisy Herrera, and I used to work here at Lado from 2008 to 2018 for 10 years. And I was in the executive office working with um, the executive team and secretaries, Lancaster and San Diego. Um, so I am here to talk to you about domestic violence survivors in dependency cases, specifically bias, advocacy, and referrals. I really tailored this training having you in mind and knowing what type of work you do. Um, and being a social advocate myself, I really think that this is important information to know. Um, I also wanted to let you know that I have a double master's in Latin American Studies and Mexican American Studies from Casa de Lake. That's my current job right now, and I'm also an independent contractor for the East LA Women's Center. Um, just one quick disclosure before we continue. Um, I will go over some information that be that may be triggering. So please, if you need to step out to take care of yourself, please do so. Um, and I'll be here for a few minutes right after the training if anybody needs to talk to me one-on-one. Um, -on -one. All right, so going quickly over the presentation agenda, I will be defining domestic violence. I think it's very important to know what that definition is right now in 2020. It has changed over time, and it's just important to know what has been added to that definition. I will be going over statistics nationally and within California. And again, because this training is for Los Angeles County and San Diego County, I have also included statistics for both of those counties. The couple of sections after that will be our core for this training, uh, because I want you to reflect on your own bias, any bias that you may have towards domestic violence victims and survivors or anything that you have come across with your clients in your dependency cases. Think of it as us killing the onion, the onion being domestic violence, and just figuring out how many layers, what those layers are, and how in, everything can interwine. So those uh, that core for this presentation, presentation will be the bias against domestic violence victims and survivors, the social difficulties that they face, and what I've been calling the second, um, the second hidden abuse cycle. It's something that I've been, that I've created as I come in, across domestic violence survivors. I will be providing an overview of the East LA Women's Center and the services that they provide, just in case you ever need to refer one of your clients to us. And I will end with other referrals and other types of advocacy tools that you can use um, in your dependency cases to further help any clients that have been a victim of domestic, domestic abuse. <coughs> Um, before we move on, I just want to let you know that I will be using the terms victim and survivor interchangeably. They both mean somebody that has experienced domestic violence, um, but towards the end I'll explain to you why I prefer to use survivor over victim, but just know that whether I use victim or survivor, it's the same thing. Um, also, throughout our presentation, I will reference some of the um, domestic violence cases that I have worked on so that you can sort of put a face or not a face but at least a case to specific data or a specific example and of course we will have a Q&A at the end I'm leaving about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the presentation if you do want to ask a question please wait until the very end and for anybody here in the conference room please make sure that you turn on the microphones in the middle of the tables and speak into the microphone for our remote locations to be able to hear you 
And of course, I will respect your time because I understand that you have to go back to the courthouse. And that makes me miss those parking passes even more. Mm -hmm. okay, so what is domestic violence? According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, domestic violence is the willful intimidation, physical assault, battery, sexual assault, and or other abusive behavior as part of a systematic pattern of power and control perpetrated by one intimate partner against another. It includes physical violence, sexual <coughs> violence, threats, and emotional abuse. Um, so let's just quickly unpack that. Notice how perhaps growing up you thought of domestic violence as being physical. It's no longer just physical. It can be sexual. It can be psychological, emotional, financial. That's a new one. And it can also include threats, so verbal abuse. And of course, the <coughs> frequency and the severity varies case to case, person to person, relationship to relationship. So question of the day to see if you've been paying attention. <coughs> Is domestic violence always physical? No. 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 Not anymore. It used, to be. it used to be recognized as only being physical and something that um, would leave bruising or ev evidence of there being violence. Uh, but that's not a myth. You may still hear people say, well, she didn't have a black eye, so she wasn't abused. But that's not the case anymore. There's different forms of abuse. There's different types of abuse. And it's a cycle, and it, it winds, and there's layers, <coughs> and there's linkage. Um, plus, a lot of abusers are now trying to um, be smart about it, and still, abuse or person without leaving any evidence. Now, before we get to the actual core of the presentation, and since you work in a law firm, I thought it would be fitting to present to you some penal codes. Um, California only recognizes the following for actual prosecution, and that's Penal Code 273.5, which is the domestic abuse, and that's when one person inflicts actual physical injury on another person. Um, it could be something as minor as a scratch or something as big as a broken bone, but there has to be something physical for there to be a prosecution under that penal code. The second one is the uh, 243E1, which is the, the uh, domestic battery. Uh, the difference between the two is the domestic battery does not need a physical injury, just a um, some type of force or violence against the, um, the survivor. So for example, if the abuser were to grab a chair and throw it at the survivor, that would count as domestic battery because the um, abuser intended to hurt the person <coughs> even though they did not. Um, but again, these penal codes demonstrate that Right now, domestic violence can only be punishable under these penal codes if there's some sort of um, injury or an intent for an injury. Um, so that's definitely a barrier that domestic violence survivors have. So what does domestic violence look and sound like? Well, one is the physical, that's the one that we know. Uh, the one that we see bruising, scratching, broken bones, burn marks, uh, sexual assault, even trafficking. Um, but we can also see physical violence in form of withdrawing someone's medication. So I once had a caller um, on our hotline who indicated that she was diabetic and her spouse was not letting her take insulin. And without that insulin, her body would not function the way that it's supposed to. So that's a form of physical violence, and one that we might not even think about as much as the scratches, the burns, the black eyes. Uh, the second one is financial. 
this one, again, I think it's new to the field, and it's one that the abuser could get away with a lot, and that's setting the person on a strict budget. Now, we're not talking about $50 for Starbucks a month. No, we're talking about limiting that person to a budget that is unfeasible. So perhaps giving the person $20 a month for food. Something that is just not not workable and for no actual reason other than to make them suffer. We're also talking about ruining the other person's credit. Opening credit cards, defaulting loans, or taking over their assets. Either their entire paycheck, their savings account, their other bank accounts. Um, I had another caller who stated that she was experiencing financial abuse and her partner was giving her a set budget a month to, to buy groceries. And if she was unable to provide receipts for those purchases, um, she would be in trouble. And if she were to get close to that budget and still needed to buy groceries for herself, and the kids, um, he would cut her off and tell her, you figure out how to, how to feed the kids. So we're talking <coughs> something to that extreme. Uh, the third one is emotional. Um, we are familiar with this when we're talking about verbal abuse, um, name calling, degrade, degrading the other person, bringing down their sense of worthless. Um, but the other ones that we are not that familiar with would be forcing the person to have an abortion, forcing the person to have children against their will. So we're talking about either forcing them to take or discard their birth control. Fourth one is verbal, which again overlaps with emotional, and that's the name calling, degrading, sense of worthless, but it could also include threats either threats against the person, threats against the children, family members, etc. And the final one is the psychological. Um, we're talking about playing games with the victim, saying one thing, doing the other, or making the victim think that they're crazy, or making them feel as if they are the problem, that they are causing um, the abuser to act out. So some national statistics for you real quickly, and I'm not going to read them all. You do have a handout in your pamphlet on the right side. Um, those statistics are in those handouts. Um, but I wanted to highlight the first one. One in three women and one in four men in the U.S. have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. It could be something minor as blocking the doorway and not letting the partner exit, shoving the partner, or um, something escalating more such as a punch, a kick. This one I want to highlight because you do work in dependency and that one in 15 children are exposed to intimate partner violence each year and 90% of those children are eyewitnesses to this violence. Uh, for California, and again you have a handout specifically for California <coughs> statistics. Um, in one single day, domestic violence shelters served almost 5,800 women and children, which is roughly about 100 per county. And the forcible rape occurs every 56 minutes. Now, when we think of rape and who is doing the rape, what comes to mind? What has society taught us? Exactly. That the rape is being done by a stranger. Now, that's not true. That's a myth. Um, chances, are, chances are a person will be raped by somebody that they know. And in this case, not for this statistic, but for our presentation, uh, rape can occur in relationships. <coughs> Specifically for Los Angeles County, 
the LAPD responded to about 48,000 domestic violence calls, or respond to 48,000 domestic violence calls every year. The LA District Attorney's Office sees about 11,000 domestic violence cases a year, or about 200 new ones weekly. And domestic violence crimes reported have been on the rise since 2015, when they spiked over 20% just in Los Angeles alone. For San Diego, in a sample study of 100 DV incidents reported to law enforcement, children were present in 37% of the cases. And almost 4,000 defendants were prosecuted for domestic violence by the DA office. Of course, these are just reported cases. We can definitely estimate that so many more cases go unreported. And there are a lot of reasons why. But one, specifically for our marginalized communities, is the fear of deportation due to your legal status. So it's interesting to note that despite the um, statistics from LA, reports of sexual assault dropped by 25% and domestic violence by 10% among LA's Latino population since the beginning of 2017. And um, the LAPD chief, Charlie Beck, speculates that this was due to the negative political climate of the fear of deportation, so uh, victims would be scared of denouncing their abuser for fear of having that abuser deported, or even themselves deported if they would open a case or even testify in court. Um, I had a caller tell me that she wanted to get away from the abuse, abuse but she did not want to denounce her abuser because she didn't want him to get deported. Um, she said that he would face death if he were to get deported back to his country. So just leaving him alone was enough for her. She didn't want to seek um, justice for what he had done. Okay, so this is the core of our presentation. And again, I tailored this having you in mind and what you do for your clients. These are the social stigmas that silence domestic violence survivors. The first one is culture. We've seen how sometimes survivors don't want to leave a relationship because they believe that marriage is forever. You're in it for the long run, regardless of what happens, you need to stay in that relationship through thick and thin. And there's also beliefs in several cultures that once a man chooses their partner, it's for life. And you're stuck with that person for life. The second one that you're all familiar with is the looming problem of DCFS, taking the children away if there is a domestic violence um, report and having the kids grow up without one of the parents, um, which, would, which would be in a broken home or having the children bounce between mom and dad. The third one is the distrust for law enforcement. Um, there are several communities that believe that law enforcement is trigger friendly. Um, so if they were to call 911 because of a domestic violence dispute, they're scared that law enforcement will just arrive and instead of um, questioning or instead of questioning the abuser, they would just um, end their life. And also there's the belief that there is no snitching. Um, even if a survivor wants to get away from the relationship, she should. Um, without having to snitch on the other person, 
because the other person could either um, place a threat on their families or on the victim themselves. I had a human trafficking survivor <coughs> who would not give me the name of her abuser or her pimp um, for fear that he knew where her family lived and he, according to her, she would not stop um, trying to hurt her if she ever did snitch. It was that street code that they have. The fourth one is legal status, and as I mentioned, that fear for deportation for either the survivor or denouncing the abuser, and the fact that if someone is deported, very likely that they'll face death when they return to their country of origin. Uh, religion, um, again, interwines <coughs> with the culture, the myth that, um, or the belief that divorce is not an option, regardless of what is happening, the belief that a woman should obey her man, and a woman should please her man, regardless of what is happening. And of course, the last one, economical reasons, the lack of financial support for the victim, Perhaps her credit is ruined, there are no resources for the victim to, to reach out to, and perhaps no, no place to live. Um, so just keep in mind that, as I mentioned, some of these um, factors, layers will overlap um, just because domestic violence does run in a cycle. Oh, sorry, I forgot one more, the middle one. And that's one that I actually created, um, and I call it I Told You. It's when the survivor hears, I told you not to date him, I told you not to marry him, I told you not to have kids with him, and I told you to leave before <coughs> it got bad. So we may all have an idea of why domestic violence victims stay in the abusive relationship. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few that I think are very crucial. One of them being uh, unsupported friends and family. This goes a long way. If you have people telling you stay, 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 make it work, divorce is not an option, what are you going to do raising uh, kids into homes, um, that really does affect the, the victim psychologically. Fear of losing custody of any of the children if they leave or divorce their abuser. Um, we have seen cases where the survivor will file for divorce and the abuser will try and get 100% of the custody. Uh, the lack of having somewhere to go no family, no shelters, and if they're out of state, um, the human trafficking survivor that I had, she was from Illinois. Um, she moved out here three months before I met her, and she had nowhere to go. Um, she had been to shelters, but they just weren't supporting her and getting her out of the state. Um, luckily, I was able to reach out to CAST, Coalition Against Slavery and Trafficking, and they were able to help her um, purchase a train ticket to go back home. Um, real quickly, one reason why they might also stay that we might not think about would be if they have pets, and if they believe that the pets cannot go with them and they do not want to leave their pets behind. Um, luckily, there are shelters that accept pets. I haven't come across that situation yet, but I do have a list of domestic violence shelters that accept pets. Okay, so the bias that domestic violence survivors <coughs> face, uh, the biggest one is gender roles and expectations. Um, there's that myth that the victims are always women, um, which is of course not true at all. 
and the myth that women cause the abuse because they are either doing something that they're not supposed to or they're not doing something that they are supposed to. The myth that uh, women are exaggerating and being dramatic over a part of their relationship. And of course the myth that children cannot thrive in a two-parent home. Tying in with, with the myth that victims are only women is toxic mascul masculinity, um, and the myth that males cannot be abused, and if they are, that they are not strong enough to stop it. And of course that there is no abuse in a male-male relationship because they don't have that female in the relationship that is supposed to be dramatic and blowing things out of proportion, and that there is no abuse in female-female relationships because they don't have that male dominance, um, which we know it's not true. Um, violence stems from power and control, and any gender can practice it. Uh, we have the cultural expectations, um, where we expect people to keep their business private, to work on their relationship regardless of what is going on, that divorce is not an option, and that we negatively mark women if they become single mothers. Um, for the housing and work spheres, um, survivors may <coughs> see that their rental may be denied by the manager if the manager feels that renting the unit to the survivor can put everybody else at risk <coughs> by, by assuming that the, the um, abuser will show up. And with work, even though this could be a good thing, it could also be a bad thing, if survivors have their workload lightened um, because the manager is trying to help them out, but the manager doesn't realize that they're putting them in a position where um, they will be discriminated against by other employees for that lack of, of uh, workload. Law enforcement response. We often see the um, survivors say that if they call law enforcement to, to, for assistance, law enforcement sees it at, as them nagging because they've been calling constantly which would create some distrust between the survivors and law enforcement. And the lack of support, again, being the lack of support from, from family, friends, and even uh, resources from the, the county, not having adequate resources to assist these survivors. Uh, with social diffic difficulties, we often see, again, the looming DCFS case and losing custody of the children, either to DCFS or in a divorce case, losing assets such as uh, funds, property, retirement, <coughs> insurance, the lack of support by police, specifically when they don't want to write a report because they think it's a domestic dispute versus domestic <coughs> violence, and the reluctance by prosecutors because they often only take cases that can guarantee a win, and the judges rarely impose the maximum sentence for those that are prosecuted. Probation or a fine is more common than not. And lastly, the um, societal factors. We're talking about identity and self-worth. Um, the woman seeing herself as a mother and a wife, in relation to the abuser, um, perhaps happiness not being in her cars, perhaps her being a, or having done something to karma to get her back, her believing that she caused these problems, so abuse is necessary. And again, the lack of assistance, not enough DV shelters. I cannot tell you how many times I have tried helping a survivor locate shelter, and it's just not possible. Um, all right, so the survivor escaped the abuse, but now what? Now we have new and repeating bias and abuse some of the same factors that I mentioned. We have the looming concern of, of 
the DCFS case and the mother being labeled as unfit because she did not protect her children. Um, but what if she was protecting her children by staying with the abuser? It's a double-edged sword. Um, <coughs> the lack of support from family and friends, of course, and the inability to find work if there is a lack of childcare or the inability to find housing if there's a lack of work. It's just all connected. So this is what I've been uh, working on when I work with um, survivors. It's something that I've seen and it's what I call the second hidden cycle because it is silent. And um, the first is the what ifs. The what if I obeyed? What if I left earlier? What if I talked to him about the abuse in the beginning? What if I didn't wear that? What if I didn't go out? And the second one being um, leaving the abuser but having all these barriers and difficulties against you when you're trying to create a new life. Mm -hmm. And the emotional struggle. The um, survivor still loving the abuser because they have kids or because they've been together for a long time and hoping that the abuser will change. Um, I had a survivor tell me that even though he had gotten physical with her, she still hoped that he would get help and he would change and she could go back with him. Um, with the new abuse I'm talking about, not just the abuser continuing to abuse the survivor from afar, we're talking about stalking, calling, social media stalking, but also the abuse that the survivor could fall into. Um, abusing alcohol, drugs, medication, um, to help her cope with the anxiety and the psychological damage and depression that she, um, that was bestowed on her by the abuse. And lastly, the fear of thriving. Um, the survivor asking, how can I do this? How can I move on? How will I do this? Who's going to help me? And maybe was it best for me to stay? Okay, so real quickly, just some information on the East LA Women's Center. So the East LA Women's Center began in 1976 as a crisis hotline and it was the first in the state of California to offer Spanish speaking counselors <coughs> and then it evolved into an actual organization and even though we have women in our name we do provide <coughs> services for men so the theory that the East LA Women's Center uses is the relational cultural <coughs> theory we really try to be trauma-informed, culturally sensitive, um, and provide services with, with that in mind. And they strive to keep families together, which is exactly what Lidl does. Okay, so in your packet, I put, and it's actually behind the, Power and control wheel. Um, it's a interconnected model of what the East LA Women's Center does. Um, but we have the 24-7 hotline service by staff, volunteers like myself, and what we call promotoras. Um, English and Spanish speakers on rotation. We do in-center and out-center referrals. Um, we do a lot of crisis intervention and emergency safety planning, which has to do with um, locating shelters for survivors. Um, we have seven therapists and two counselors, all Latinas, so that could tell you um, what population we work for the most. Specifically, I wanted to highlight the Wellness Center that's at the Los Angeles County Medical Center. Um, it's an on-site, one-stop shop, as we call it and it's to help 
survivors that are there for a doctor's appointment get services um, related to domestic violence because we would often see that um, survivors would go to their doctor's appointment and that's their time to be away from the abuser and um, would be able to get referrals and information from the wellness center. Uh, we do accompaniments. We do several. The main one is the hospital, which I'll go into in, in a bit. Restraining order filings, as, as well as um, going to the hearing with the survivor. We have been able to provide advocates that would attend the uh, DCFS, DCFS hearing, but not inside the actual courtroom. They would just stay in the lobby with the uh, survivor until their case is called and to meet with the survivor right after, um, just for emotional support. And we do accompany them to the police station. So if we have a survivor that wants to file a report against the abuser, we um, accompany them to the police station. And we have a sex trafficking specialist who specifically works with um, survivors of human trafficking. So we are able to provide these advocates and to promise confidentiality based on this evidence code that gives a survivor the right to request a advocate for accompaniment at most hospitals and courts. <coughs> we focus on these survivors and pro provide them with resources and referrals. Um, the <coughs> hospital accompaniments that I specific specifically wanted to mention, uh, we do SART and non-SART. Um, SART is the uh, when a survivor needs a rape kit done. Um, we are called by the Los Angeles County Medical Center, San Gabriel Medical Center, and PIH. And we are there with the survivor in the exam room. Of course, we are separated by the curtain, but we are there to provide emotional support for the survivor that is going, that is completing the rape kit. And we are also called out if we have a domestic violence survivor seeking shelter or services. Uh, so that's start and non-start. Um, right now, I'm the main advocate for Los Angeles County Medical Center. I'm often on call 24, for 24 hours a day for five or six days straight. Um, and I don't get many calls. I get perhaps one or two a week. Um, but that tells you that cases are just not being reported. So just real quickly, just wanted to point out specifically the one in red, that a thousand women and their 2,000 children received domestic violence counseling, support, and safety planning in 2018. And as of July 2018, our specific shelter, Hope and Heart Emergency Shelter, has provided a safe haven to 90 women and 50 children and provided housing assistance to over 250 individuals and families. Um, I put here that we train healthcare providers um, at LAC Medical Center. We train them to call us when they need an advocate and for them to be more trauma informed and recognize the signs, either physical or not physical, of possible domestic violence especially if the survivor is going for a regular, uh, regular doctor appointment. So that's a lot of information in about 45 minutes. And now, how can you advocate for domestic violence survivors? So first thing is to refer to victims as survivors. Um, it's a small step towards empowerment and self-worth, but when you think of a victim, you automatically think of a victim of a crime, and you may think of a victim as having have been helpless, but by referring to the person as a survivor, you're telling them that they survived a tragedy, and we have an idea of how many do not survive. <coughs> so I always make it a point to tell my survivors, you got out, you left, you survived, your new life begins now. 
you can refer them to the Isale Women's Center hotline. I did place a little pink card in your in your in your booklet. And for San Diego and Lancaster, I'll get cards out to you shortly. Um, I recommend that you have it with you, and if you know somebody that would benefit from our hotline or our services, you can just have them take a picture of the hotline number and we'll, we'll assist them. And that goes for Lancaster and San Diego. For San Diego, we can provide them with services and crisis centers in San Diego. Uh, the most important thing is to have the person call and be connected with somebody. That's the first step of advocacy. Um, consider asking your client if they experience domestic violence or as, as you're talking to them, if you can pick up on signs. Um, you don't have to tell them that they've experienced domestic violence. You could just give them our number and say, hey, just in case you ever need it. Um, that would go a long way. Here are other referrals for survivors. Um, we have the Victim Compensation Board here in the state of California, and it's also connected to the to services specific girls in Los Angeles County and San Diego County. And I believe some of you may be familiar with the U visa and T visa. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are always options. Um, I also included the Violence Against Women Act, and it has information on those two visas, as well as phone numbers for legal counsels that can help survivors with, with uh, finding for those two visas. Okay. Thank you for being here today. It was great to see you all once again. And just remember that I think highly of you all. <laughs>
and given sufficient services, whether the survivor goes on or not, that man, for the most part, will continue to get into relationships and continue to abuse. So the real danger to survivors is the insufficient services and treatment and the lack of anything really going on. And as you know, in Los Angeles County, the only thing we have usually for the men is the 52-week program that they have to pay for, and our clients can't afford it, so they, they can't, they, it, it never happens. So in your experience, what is out there for our clients, because we're not here to destroy families, even if a relationship ends, he is still the father of the children, and he has a right to reunification, and he has a right to good services. So what's out there for him? Um, good question, <coughs> because, <coughs> so the LA County or San Diego County, they really have to look at the services that are being provided and the cost. Um, I think that it's definitely a dialogue that needs to happen between, for example, the Victim Compensation Board, because I didn't say it, but they cover bills and counseling, but it's not enough. Um, and it takes weeks, months for that process. We all know how red tape works. Um, so I think what needs to happen is peace over violence, the um, East LA Women's Center, maybe even the executive director for these agencies need to talk with the Victims Conversation Compensation Board and not only do they need to talk about what services the survivors need, but also need to talk about or need to talk with um, other agencies and courthouses to see what the abusers need. Because, um, yeah, as you mentioned, they have the right to, to see their children. Um, my concern is if they see the children and they're not fixed if they're going to abuse the children now that they are not able to abuse their partner. Um, so it, it's a dialogue and it's just the LA County itself needs to have like a, a network of programs, of referrals for both the survivor and the abuser. Right now they tend to only focus on one party. Um, and that's the dumb ball, that they're only focusing on one person. Um, but at least us, we're trying to focus on the survivor in, in the instances that the survivor wants to leave. Um, but there, there needs to be um, programs and services for those that do not want to leave, but they just want to work on the family unit together. Um, but it's a it's a challenge. I mean, I think we're progressing. We're not there yet. We won't be there for a couple of decades, but at least it's a conversation that we started to have, bringing to the light domestic violence and all the layers, and et cetera. Thank you. Thanks, I have a question. Um, my question is, you had mentioned that you all don't, you accompany, uh, you accompany the survivor to court, but you don't go into the courtroom with them. Is there any particular reason for that? And is it possible that you all, at some point, can start going into court with them? Because we know, especially at the detention hearing and at the contested disposition, those are crucial arguments where we are asking, especially if we're the survivor and we're representing the survivor, that's where we're arguing for the kids to be released with safety measures put in place, and it really does keep up our argument and show the judge, you know, mom really is serious about this. Her support person is sitting right in the back, mm -hmm. and it helps when that person stands up as proof that mom has already started the healing process and she's already started dealing with the truth of the situation as opposed to saying, oh, well, she's thinking about it or she's, you know, looking into it or, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, so right now, I do know that advocates do go into the courtroom when it has to do with the uh, restraining order. 
uh, hearings um, or even a divorce case, the advocate will sit behind the survivor if the survivor ever takes a stand. Um, because we've had judges who believe that a survivor will, with their facial expression, either hint at the survivor, no, I'm sorry, the advocate with their facial expression will hint at the survivor as to what they should be saying. Um, so judges will have us sit behind the survivor so that we don't give anything away with their faces. Um, if, the sur if the advocate is able to go into the courtroom, uh, children's courthouse, um, we'll go in there. Um, that's okay with us. Um, I just know that for certain hearings, I believe, only the parties are allowed to be in there. Or am I wrong with that? Because it's a children's case. If, if, mm -hmm. but if nobody objects. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so if nobody objects, these advocates can be in there. Okay. Um, so if yeah, that, that would be fine with us if nobody objects the advocate to be in there. We'll definitely be in there to not only provide that support um, for the survivor, but also to assist the survivor's attorney with um, demonstrating that the survivor's serious. Yeah. I have one question. Uh, does LA County, uh, we were in San Diego County, but most of LA County, does, uh, is there any free DV program in, in Los Angeles County anywhere for the victims of birth? Us. Absolutely free? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Our services are completely free. Our hotline is completely free. Um, we receive a, we receive grants, several grants, um, from from our, our mother organization, um, whose name I don't know right now. Um, yeah, we provide services for survivors, not for the alleged abusers. And we, um, I know that when somebody calls the hotline, um, we have to fill out this fact sheet um, where we have the person's name and what services they're looking for. If they're looking for a court-appointed <laughs> domestic violence program, we have to check that off, meaning that our services qualify as court-appointed. Um, Services. Yes. Do you have any programs or can you refer to programs that are targeted to our male victims of domestic violence? Um, and related question, um, do you have like a resource list that you could share with us of shelters that either take older male children, because that's a problem sometimes for our clients, or male victims of domestic violence? Because getting them out of those situations somewhere safe uh, is a problem and their kids end up getting to it. So the resource list I have of the domestic violence shelters um, where I indicate which shelters accept pets, I also indicate which shelters accept men and their children. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and I can happily put something together for Los Angeles County and San Diego County um, because I have four members for both counties for domestic violence shelters and I can specifically specifically put which ones accept men. Um, we can provide counseling for men as well. Um, and we also have this program inside the East LA Women's Center that's called, um, it's what we call male engagement, and you'll find it in the, in the printout. Um, but we also have healing circles for men and talking circles for men, not just for the men to talk about how to stop um, their gender from abusing, but also for them to talk if they have been a victim. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.